All right. Well, good morning. So nice to see you here today. Really excited to hear from Finn. We've been working together for a year and a half or whatever it's been. And um, I know that Finn is a creative powerhouse. I'm really excited to hear about uh, current uh, Finn's career today. So anyway, um, I want to thank our visual arts presenter, uh, Comfort Keepers. Really want to thank the members who support these programs as, as well, and most of those who supplied us with the great copy and things there. And of course, thank Alyssa, who every week sets up uh, the Zoom, sets, sets everything up for us for our so, uh, and I met most of you, I'm sure. So. Uh, okay, so I just want to give you a little background about Finn. Finn started dancing with the School of Ballet in 2008 and presently works as the assistant to the artistic director, Heather, uh, there and instructs Dance Fusion and the School of Ballet video crew. So upon graduating from high school, Finley attended the University of Illinois at Urbana campaign, pursuing BFA in dance. They presented their choreographic work in collaboration with the School of Ballet Dancers at the Midwest Regional Alternative Dance Festival's Youth Performance in 2018, 2020, and 2021. And during the summer of 21, Finley held an internship with Bates Dance Festival, performing technical production duties for the festival's performances. The following fall, they studied screen dance one-on-one -on -one with the legendary Peter Sparling, uh, learning techniques of creating choreography for the camera. Finley co completed the I asked you look for a lot of this. Um, Palabalus teacher training workshop through Palabalus summer intensive workshop in 2023. I'm looking forward to hearing about that. Finley's teachings include writing contemporary and modern dance techniques, contact improvisation, and screen dance. So um, anyway, thank you so much for doing this. And thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hello, thank you, Sheila, for the introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here today talking to you about uh, my work in screen dance and uh, how I've worked with the CTAC School of Ballet with that a little bit. Um, so to begin, oops, is the battery. I'll turn it, I'm gonna turn the remote off and back on. Would that help? Oh. I need another battery. <laughs> Hold please. <laughs> <laughs> All the way to the uh, gathering, you can just tell us about the first image here. Sure, this is, um, these are the students, well, one of the students last year in the video crew filming her work that was partially done in front of green screen, which I'll talk a little bit about later, but, um, and we'll see a clip from her work too. So uh, it's really cool that we get the opportunity um, to work with the students in um, all these capacities, both filming outside and um, being able to work with green screen. Um, that adds a whole other element to screen dances and the editing thereof, so. Sure, I yeah, I plan to talk about this more with more clips, but um, yeah, so as you see the green screen, um, it kind of serves as, oh, there we go, <laughs> um, as a way to key out dancers from the background and then be able to put another background behind them um, so they can really dance in any capacity, they can dance underwater, they can dance um, just really with any background, which makes it kind of cool. We have remotes, yay, thank you. All right, uh, so to start off, um, a little bit of background on myself. I began dancing with the Career Center School of Ballet in 2008, 
and uh, I started when I was eight years old. This picture is when I was 10 years old. Um, so it's from Alice in Wonderland, I believe. And um, I went through the program all the way through my senior year of high school. The second picture is me as a frog in 2018. Um, and that was for Sleeping Beauty. Um, and I always enjoyed dancing, but really dove into the idea of making dance a career when I started exploring sound editing and video projection being paired with uh, the choreography I was creating or other people's choreography. Um, so I was given the opportunity to sort of explore sound editing and do sound editing for all of our productions in 2016. Um, so that started my interest and love for editing. And um, I continued doing all the sound editing for the um, all of the School of Ballet productions ever since. Um, so then in 2017, um, I started exploring using video projection too with um, a piece that I created for Fall for Dance that year. And um, that was kind of my first experience with video editing. Um, and we'll take a look at that piece here in a minute. Um, this piece was also performed at RADFest. This was the first year we did the Midwest Regional Alternative Dance Festival in Kalamazoo. Um, Heather Rowey, the artistic director, did some research on this festival. Um, this festival is a really cool alternative dance experience for Michigan, but also it brings in artists from around the world, really, that are um, dancers in different alternative modalities, whether it's modern dance or contemporary. Um, and they have master classes, performances, lectures, and they have a whole day dedicated to youth where there's master classes and then a youth performance. Um, and so this was the first year we did Radfest in 2018. And um, I was really excited to have my work in that. Um, so this clip is from a piece I made called Is Humanity Humane? Um, kind of exploring this idea of racial injustice um, and wanting to be able to uh, work with this idea and dance. And so this clip is just from the very end of it where I um, first sort of used video project projection to accompany a uh, live dance. So, you yeah. know. just a little clip of that um the video projection it's I <laughs> kind of have to laugh when I watch it back because you'll see the progression um just over the last five years how we've really been been able to develop um all of this video projection and editing and so it's it's cool to see where it all started um after graduating from the program in 2018 I um started as a dance major at the University of, of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Um, and while I was a dance major there, I had the opportunity to take dance documentation. Um, and dance documentation um, is essentially what it sounds like. It's basically um, a videographer 
being required to film live dance work and edit it in a way that preserves the work so that choreographers can restage it or at least there's a historic document of this live work because really video these days is the only thing preserving live dance work. Um, in the past, there were some written forms of recording dance, but uh, those are pretty obsolete now. So um, I really enjoyed being able to further explore this idea of video editing through dance documentation. Um, and at the same time, as I was doing dance documentation, taking that course and other courses at University of Illinois, I was also still creating my own work and working with this idea of pairing live dance with video projection. Uh, this is an, an example of me actually kind of dancing with myself in video. Um, I also, during my senior year of high school, started these uh, daily improv videos where I would film myself every single day improvising, which was kind of a cool journal um, thing for me anyway to see myself progress in that way as a dancer um, I reached a thousand consecutive days of filming it myself which meant I had a very huge library of different footage to pull from so this is me this is me performing at the University of Illinois in um, just a little studio performance um, and this is me relating again to the video projection. So just that. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that was a little fun project. And that this project, I also created a screen dance sort of relating to the same theme of like how children really relate to nature. Um, so this was an exploration of that. And then I had also created a screen dance with um, one of the students with, at the School of Ballet, um, sort of relating again to this idea of children really relating to nature. Um, and then <laughs> moving forward, the pandemic started. Um, and at the start of COVID, I moved back home. And um, I had still been working again with the School of Ballet, doing all their sound editing and really wanting to be involved as much as possible. Um, so when I came back home, Miss Heather reached out to me just really a few days after the pandemic started. Um, to sort of brainstorm some ideas that we could use to keep the program going through the lockdown. Um, and so within a week, uh, Heather had reached out to a slew of other alums to teach classes over Zoom, um, including other professional dance teachers that the alums had connections to. Um, and it was beyond just Zoom classes that we offered. We ended up offering like lectures to our advanced students. Um, they ended up doing group projects, putting together their own ideas for creating a ballet, um, as well as learning and figuring out different ways to perform in this new video um, platform. So the uh, platform of being in Zoom kind of lended itself naturally in a way to working then with creating dance through video. Um, so these images are from our working on our screen dance, Nutcracker 2020. Um, and we'll take a little bit more of a look at this in a minute, uh, but just to sort of think about filming 
um, site-specific screen dance. This is one type of way that we can create screen dance. And here we see images of filming outside around Petoskey. Um, so therefore we were filming specifically on a site. Um, and within the Zoom classes I was teaching, I sort of started exploring the idea of also using video um, as a way to influence and enhance the education they were receiving. Um, and so when thinking about other ways to perform in this video platform, we, um, the dancers and I created a concept for doing a video performance over Zoom um, using the boxes that everyone was in to make an entire picture of a performance kind of. So this piece um, was actually originally choreographed by Miss Heather for Le Petit Prince, which was our June show in 2017. And so as the dancers and I were um, discussing an option for performance because their June show, June performance that year that they normally had obviously was not, um, not performing anymore. So having a rehearsal process was still important. And um, we decided that this piece would lend itself really well to the idea of being in a Zoom platform um, because the choreography was able to remain isolated within uh, different boxes and it kind of provided a cool new perspective on it too. So this is a little snippet from that. <laughs> that's kind of fun in the live performance and now I um, wish we could see the live performance too should have put a clip in of that but there were rows of three so they're all lined up as if they were still standing in person in rows of three but it still really lends itself well to being in individual boxes like this and um, yeah really cool to see it all lined up that way um, so then moving forward into Nutcracker um, we decided to create an entire Nutcracker that was solely a screen dance. Um, and we enlisted the help of Dewan Jordan, who's such a cool technical mastermind. I forget what he calls himself, but a creative video mastermind. And um, I was really honored to learn a lot from him through this process um, about filming in front of green screen and just all the different layers of editing through green screen. Um, so this is an image of what the setup looked like when we were filming in front of green screen at Great Lakes Center for the Arts. Um, so we ended up filming each dancer individually in front of the screen, then editing them into various pieces throughout the entire screen dance. Um, and so green screen, as I kind of talked about earlier, um, allows us to put any background behind the dancer and also any foreground um, as the floor was green too. So the dancer can completely be removed from the screen and then a whole entire landscape can 
be put behind them. So, um, and then also just to touch on before I move ahead, the difference between filming site specific and green screen, um, site specific when we're filming in a specific location, we're taking various shots usually um, of the dancer in a location. So there's a few different angles we're getting of the dancer that then edit together into the finished product. And we'll see some examples of site specific, um, but green screen, we're filming just the front angle. So instead of being able to see all these different aspects of a dancer, it's a lot more two dimensional. Um, but then through the editing, sometimes you can add in more effects and it becomes um, more of like a magical experience than um, just site specific, although that can be magical too. But um, So just to give you an idea of what an editing timeline looks like for, um, <laughs> for green screen, especially where we see all of these layers stacked on top of each other is where each dancer is an individual box and they're all dancing at the same time, hence them all being on top of each other. Um, we have a few site specific things where it's you just see one bar of video, um, but it got a little <laughs> intense towards the end there um, of how many layers we were adding on. And um, when you're watching some of this, obviously it's cool and you can kind of imagine how much work it probably took, but to actually see the map of it and realize, oh, wow, that was like 24 different images all happening at once. That's, that's a lot of work. So, <laughs> um, so to give you a taste of that, this is um, the clock scene, which served as the battle scene in our Nutcracker 2020. Um, so I created, um, actually we had a dancer draw sort of the outline of the clock in downtown Petoskey at the waterfront in Petoskey. And um, the dancers all sort of took shape as different numbers on the clock and then ended up battling each other. The idea was that Clara's friends were battling Fritz's friends on the clock. So here's a little excerpt of that. So these were all 12 different images stacked on top of each other, all happening at once. So I also had the dancers work with the idea of adding visual art into their dancing. And so the idea is that Clara and Fritz were drawing their weaponry to fight off each other. <laughs> so that's just a little example of the insanity that was Nutcracker 2020, but it was very cool. I, um, yeah, the whole project was super fun and lots of cool ideas from all of the choreographers. So, um, so then the following spring in 2021, uh, we tasked the students with creating their own screen dances um, after we all worked in Nutcracker. They all had a plethora of ideas and were very eager to create their own screen dance works. Um, one student's work was even accepted into a dance festival in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, so it was really cool for them to be able to not only explore this different avenue of dance, but um, take their work out into the world in a completely different way that they may have never even thought of before. 
Uh, so this is an excerpt from Amelie Hansen's screen dance, Reflections. Um, and she used a lot of different cool ideas with ice and mirrors. So we'll take a look at that now. So some cool imagery there pairing like the underneath of the ice with the movements on top. Um, and I believe she played the uh, her own music for it too. So um, it was cool for the students to really be able to kind of, as I was able to find different avenues to take dance into in the future as a career, um, this kind of opened their eyes to different possibilities in the dance field to work in. Um, with sound, with video editing, um, and yeah, I um, think it was a really cool opportunity for them to sort of just open their horizons a little bit. Um, so then following the spring, I, well, actually backing up, kind of at the beginning of COVID, um, I think it was during RadFest, right before the beginning of COVID, um, I was connected with Peter Sparling who is a professor emeritus at the University of Michigan. And he's really a legendary dancer with Martha Graham. He's done, he had his own company um, and has then done a lot of work in screen dance too. So over the pandemic, he and I um, communicated quite a bit, sharing ideas on each other's work and giving, or him mostly giving me suggestions and advice on my work, which was really helpful. So it was around spring when I reached out to him and asked if he'd be interested in being my private teacher for a semester. And he so graciously said yes. Um, and so I um, ended up moving out to Portland, Oregon that fall, the next fall, and um, was working with him over Zoom online on sort of his screen dance semester that he taught to his college students um, and working one-on-one -on -one with him on that. So this is an excerpt from a screen dance I made while working with Peter. Um, I was able to film some of this in Michigan before moving to Portland. Um, and this was kind of in a way a little ode to like finding my new home in Portland. Um, and uh, this specific screen dance was, I believe this was the first project which was intended to just be me exploring the idea of filming a solo in different angles and gluing those together. And then I made it a little bit more of a project. So this is just an excerpt from that. Yeah. So all that dancing was done on a green screen, then you're importing all of the video behind it? Um, this was not. This was site specific. So I actually was dancing out in the woods. <laughs> um, and then this is 
in my apartment in Portland. Um, so I had, before moving out to Portland, I had three friends film three different angles of my little, it was just improv improvised. Um, but I had three angles to then edit together um, into creating what looks like a seamless, and it is a seamless dance. Um, and really between the three angles, the idea is that the editing is so seamless that you barely even notice that three angles are happening, but it's just, yeah, it's there and um, provides some different perspective throughout the solo. So um, yeah, so that's kind of along the lines of what a lot of site specific screen dances are where you're taking a few angles of the same choreography and then in editing, uh, melding them together in a way that's seamless and allows the audience to see the work from a lot of different angles and sort of get a different, um, I guess, insight into the movement because when we're watching movement on stage, it is kind of two-dimensional or you're only really seeing it from one angle. So with the video camera involved, you're able to kind of really see all the different ways a dancer is able to move and kind of what's happening a little bit more. Um, so throughout the semester, um, I ended up creating a lot of different works with Peter. Um, and then the following spring, um, I, I was still, of course, doing sound editing with School of Ballet. Um, and always, actually, while I was out in Portland, I was still um, teaching through Zoom too. So I was still really connected with the program. Um, I always felt myself wanting to come back to the program, whether I was at school or wherever I was. I just, the program was so in my blood that I just always wanted to be a part of it. So when um, Ms. Heather the following spring asked if I would be interested in being her assistant, I had, I took some time to think about it, but ultimately I knew that this was the right next step. And I was super excited to return back to Northern Michigan and work really more closely with the program. Um, so upon my return in 2022, following my education with Peter, um, I began teaching screen dance to the students a little bit more regularly. Um, and then I soon realized the need for a more structured class to teach screen dance in rather than just teaching little bites here and there. Um, I wanted to develop a course that really felt like a collegiate level course, or at least a course that um, was dedicated to really educating the students from start to finish on how to create a screen dance. Um, so in the summer of 2023, the next year, I um, developed the concept for the School of Ballet video crew which um, required the students to complete an application process to be a part of the video crew. Um, and then the once accepted, they would be divided or the coursework was divided into two semesters where fall semester we do dance documentation and then spring semester we do screen dance. So they really get the full breadth of what it means to film and edit dance in these two different categories, kind of. Um, so in dance documentation, the students learn how to properly film live dance, learning uh, basic camera moves, functions, and then techniques for editing live dance. Um, so currently we're in the fall semester and um, the students, I worked with the students in four classes at the beginning of the semester, teaching them uh, how to film live dance, how to edit it. And now the students are tasked with filming Fall for Dance and Nutcracker rehearsals. And once they have footage from these rehearsals, they will edit uh, trailers for Fall for Dance and Nutcracker to help advertise our performances. Um, 
So it's a really great way to um, not only teach them this skill, but also then promote the work that they're making in other ways. Um, and so editing um, a trailer is obviously a lot different than editing an entire full length work, but they still um, at least are able to explore what it means to film live work and preserve um, the choreography for the choreographer. And then with the editing of a trailer, it's a little bit more, I don't wanna say it's necessarily more fun, but they have more opportunity to be creative and sort of pair different um, pieces with movement from other pieces and make their own creative choices that way. So this is the trailer um, the video crew created last year in 2023. Um, or fall for dance. So we'll take a look at that. So Fall for Dance this year is coming up really soon. It is on November 2nd. Um, and this year is a really cool show. We have guest work by Peter Sparling, uh, by Robin Pedersen, who's also a faculty emer emeritus at University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. Um, and Chris Diariano, I believe that's how you say his name, who's a soloist with Pacific Northwest Ballet as well as eight student works that were mentored by both Peter and Robin. So this year's Fall for Dance is just really rich with um, really professional level work. And um, I'm really excited for it. I'm performing in Peter's work. So if you wanna see me dance, but um, you should come anyway because the students have worked really hard um, and it's it's just gonna be a great show. So. The, the students will create the trailer soon and hopefully you'll be even more intrigued to come, but just a little plug for right now. Um, so I think, I think that's basically it for dance documentation. So we'll move on to screen dance, which is the spring semester. Um, so we spend the first eight weeks of the spring semester uh, learning the history of screen dance, watching and discussing screen dances that were created anywhere from 1945 to 2024. Um, and the students learn techniques for translating their choreographic ideas into video or into um, being able to film it through the camera. Uh, within the classes, the students get the opportunity to practice filming both site-specific and in front of green screen and being able to edit that um, so that with all of these tools that they get in these weeks, in these first eight weeks, they're then able to create their own full screen dance. Um, and they, I have them choose if they want to do a site specific, combine site specific with green screen. Um, last year, Aria chose to work both in a site specific location. So filming some choreography with different angles out in the forest again, and then also moving into green screen. Um, so we'll see a little excerpt from how she utilized both site specific and, and green screen.
That was a cool example of, <laughs> um, yeah, really directly going from site specific to green screen. Um, we kind of used green screen also in Nutcracker 2020 as sort of the like magical land um, because when you're working with green screen, you can use any background and it becomes uh, this really exciting way to sort of uh, be creative and allow the dancers to be in really any location. Um, so that was a really cool example of the magic of moving right from being out in the forest to some new land. Um, so moving into kind of where my work with projection and screen dance is now, um, last fall, uh, we, the program, had a really cool opportunity to um, collaborate with um, a program that Great Lakes Center for the Arts did. They brought up Christo Brand, who was Nelson Mandela's jailer. He um, talked about his book, um, which was essentially a biography about his work with Nelson Mandela. Um, and so um, I think, was it Rachel Seitzma Reed who reached out to Heather to create a piece of choreography that um, essentially relate, relayed themes from his book. And so then Heather reached out to me and asked me to create a projection um, to accompany her choreography that also pulled themes from the book and really kind of subtly suggested the themes that were already being suggested in the movement. Um, and so this was a really cool opportunity for me to um, really slow down and be intentional with the projection I was creating behind the dance um, and make it not be about the projection or be too intense, but really just subtly suggest themes that the dance work was already relaying. Um, and so since this project, I've been a lot more um, thoughtful and intentional behind the projection I'm creating to really um, allow the choreography to say what it's saying and just the project projection to be there as a subtle um, aid really for the choreography. Um, so here is a clip of this work. Um, so this was probably the favorite, my favorite project I've worked on so far. Um, it was just a really cool co collaboration between a lot of people. Um, we also, Heather worked with Roger Tallman on uh, layering the music with some um, cool sound effects that one of his friends in South Africa also contributed to. So yeah, it was a very cool collaboration between a lot of people and um, really... I feel like gave me the opportunity to elevate my own work. So really appreciative for that experience. Um, and so then leading into 
this past spring, 2024, um, as we um, were working on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Miss Carrie um, reached out to me about wanting to create a few different projections to go behind some of the dance scenes, as well as create an entire screen dance for the tunnel scene for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, I was able to then take the information from the fall and really think about being intentional with how I was creating um, backdrops for different scenes in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, with a tunnel scene, I was able to be a little extra creative because that this was solely a screen dance on stage. There wasn't any live dance happening. Um, so the idea was that the dancers from the Chocolate River walked right into the tunnel, which was solely on the screen. Uh, the tunnel ride, they were in a boat. So we'll watch the entire screen dance, um, which is about five minutes. Um, and this is my most recent screen dance, or at least the most recent screen dance I've created with the School of Ballet. And um, I think we all had a lot of fun on this. I know the dancers definitely had a lot of fun uh, performing this. So we'll take a look at that. So this was all green screen, by the way. Lots of layers of green screen.
<laughs> um, yeah, so that was a very fun project. Um, we we actually, the green chairs that are down in the basement, we used those for keying out the chairs since they were green. Um, so each of the dancers was performing in a green chair in front of the green screen. And then I keyed that all out, put in the benches in the purple chair. Um, so we ended up editing wise, having like 20 layers happening at once with the dancers in the background, the dancers in the seats. So it was quite a lot of work, but totally worth it. And um, definitely taught me a lot just by going through such a deep editing process um, that I feel really informed for future screen dances that I create. Um, and I'm excited for the next green screen editing that I do because I know that it'll be able to be even more elevated with the way I was informed from this one. So excited for the future. Um, so uh, we have a few more minutes and then I'd love to open it up to any questions you might have. Yes, Solomon. Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, I always get asked how many hours and never time myself or <laughs> really keep track of how many hours, but I'd say at least 20. Um, I definitely spent a few hours each day for a solid two weeks. So I think 20 is probably a good estimate. Yeah. Do you have like a library you can go to to ask for the, the copyrighted background to use? Yeah, good question. Um, a lot of images are copyrighted. We do have a few platforms, thanks to De Dewan Jordan. He has some subscriptions to image backgrounds that um, I'm fortunate or we are fortunate to be able to access. So um, because with images these days, things are so copyrighted, everyone has rights to everything. So um, there are like subscriptions through Adobe that he has and a couple others where I've been able to, yeah, pull backgrounds um, from those. The tunnel backgrounds I actually created in Canva, so um, which Cricketry has, uses Canva a lot. Um, so that's also a huge um, resource for me is being able to pull images from there too. Yeah, Michelle. And this to me, something's not at all in the ballet world. This seems really progressive, this kind of programming that's going on, this kind of development. Is this, are other schools of ballet that are maybe comparable to crooked trees if there's such a thing? <laughs> are, they, are they all so progressive in this way? Is this what you're seeing? Um, I don't know of any other schools of ballet that offer this much diverse programming with alternative dance and screen dance. Um, I think it is pretty rare for a youth dance program to offer screen dance. Um, as I've created the structure for the screen dance class, um, I've been looking for different resources of like readings that are more catered to middle school and high schoolers, and really it, that doesn't start till college. Um, so eventually I'd love to sort of create a book or textbook that um, is catered to middle schoolers and high schoolers um, with an outline for a class in dance documentation and screen dance. Um, Cause I think it's proving to be really beneficial to the students. And I think uh, it would be cool for more programs to be able to offer that. Um, so yeah, to my knowledge, we're the only ones so far. <laughs> yeah, Sheila. How does your experience as a dancer differ from your dancing or in your site specific or in this room? Good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Good question. Um, I know for the dancers, when they're dancing in the green screen, it's a lot more limiting. Um, the space they have is very limited. 
Um, so in that way, it doesn't, I think, maybe feel as naturally creative. Um, the creativity kind of comes later. <laughs> but um, with site specific, it can be really fun because dancing in a different location, um, you can pull a lot of different inspiration from your surroundings. Um, dancing outside in the cold cannot always be fun, but it's a good experience and I, you know, kind of toughens you up a little bit. So um, <laughs> as a creator, both looking at green screen and site specific, um, I guess traditionally or in the past, I've been more inspired by creating site specific. Um, I like working outside. And so I've been more inspired by um, natural surroundings, but um, I think there's equal inspiration from both. And um, um, yeah, I, I enjoy working in both. And now I think primarily when I create screen dances, I enjoy the editing aspect the most. Um, filming is fun, but when you get into editing, the project kind of becomes something completely different. And a lot of times I'll have like a projected idea of how the screen dance is gonna look when I'm filming it or even before that. And then once I have all the clips and I'm compiling them into editing, it can kind of shift and evolve and turn into something else, which I think is really cool because um, yeah, it's just like creating on the spot then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you, um, two questions, how do you syncopate, you know, like the movement of the dancers and then the screen, and then how do dancers rehearse, like, does the perfection get created before, I mean, you have mm -hmm. beforehand and then first, like, how, is it too, like, there's a time that's like, where the movement of flowers, like, uh -huh. all the people are so deep? Yeah, good question. Um, the dancers don't usually get to rehearse with the projection until being on stage. So as the person editing the projection, I'm editing it directly with the music that they're rehearsing to so that then the movement and projection are seamlessly paired together so beautifully. Um, but that's, yeah, all done prior with me listening to the music and then the choreographer also working with the same music and then it kind of all comes together that way. Um, but with the, when I was dancing with myself on the screen, I did have to actually rehearse the movement with myself, um, setting up like my computer and being like, okay, oh, too fast, too slow. And as if you had a critical eye, you probably noticed I was not exactly in time with myself all the time, but, um, it's definitely, um, a cool way to work though, to be able to actually have to force yourself or not force but um relate to the projection directly like that and um have to think about your timing based off of the video versus just the music is is a cool experience too mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah, I'm not, um, because when I was rehearsing it myself, I didn't necessarily have the scale to be able to decipher like, oh, here, I'm gonna make sure I'm like almost touching myself. So um, yeah, that's a whole other added as aspect where I'm sure some people in the audience were seeing different ways that I was relating to myself and then people on the other side were seeing it differently too. So that opens up a whole other like dialogue within the audience too, which can be cool. Yeah, Michelle. Following up a question about what images you would use. I noticed that Peter Sparling is also a visual artist. Mm -hmm. I think he's done, didn't we have a fall for dance where some of his actual images were the projection? So I was thinking yeah. about about collaborations and all what what's your thought on actually collaborating with a visual artist in creating what is a part of that screen dance yeah I'd love to I think that would be a really yeah. great way to yeah 
add in a lot of things. Um, yeah, last year's Nutcracker, and I believe this year's Nutcracker too. <laughs> Peter Sparling is creating um, all of the backdrops for Act Two, so he's painting all of the backdrops um, that are being projected behind the dancers. Um, but he has worked a lot with also movements in the projection relating to the dancers too, um, because he himself is also a visual artist. So yeah, it's definitely cool to have that aspect too. And would love to work with other visual artists in the future to um, marry all these worlds together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dancers, I think they shut that microphone. Yeah. Uh huh. Explain how that works. Um. Yeah. Basically, in rehearsal, the students had all filmed. I think you're referring to the end part where they all were filming one dancer. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. So they all in a rehearsal, filmed on um, their iPhones, themselves walking around this one dancer performing on stage. And so then I took all of the videos from all their phones, had them all send them their videos to me, and then placed them in editing in a circle. So it looked like it was happening in real life that they were filming and walking around the dancer, but that was all done ahead of time, obviously. Um, but yeah, the scrim was a really cool tool that um, was used in Peter's work two Fall for Dances ago, um, where the projection, there was essentially like kind of a see-through fabric down the center of the stage. So Peter had dancers dancing behind the scrim and in front of the scrim. So the dancers were relating to the projection in really a three-dimensional way, which was really cool. Um, so definitely something. Right. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, that was a really cool work for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I use Final Cut Pro, which is an Apple editing software. I'm a huge Apple person. I like Apple. Um, I know Dewan uses Adobe Premiere Pro. Um, he's more of a Windows person. Um, <laughs> but I, Final Cut Pro is a little more user-friendly. iMovie is definitely very user-friendly. Um, but I'd say Final Cut Pro, you can do a lot with without being like a super tech nerd. <laughs> um, but with Final Cut Pro, yeah, you can pretty seamlessly um, use the green screen and chroma key the green out into a new background. Um, obviously, having good lighting in your space when you're filming green screen is essential. I've tried to do green screen things with really low lighting, and then the editing is super not clear, and the dancers are like going in and out of the green. You saw a few moments, I think, where there was a dancer who had the gr gray vest on in the tunnel, which the gray sometimes reflects the green a little bit. So she had some holes in her a little bit, but it's okay. <laughs> so that happens when either the lighting is not the best or different things. But um, <laughs> so final cut, though, I feel like, yeah, it has a lot of opportunities for it to be uh, clean editing as possible, but also it doesn't get too deep into like a lot of technical language, so. Yeah, I have um, the laptop that I use for editing is essentially like the School of Ballet laptop. And so the students are able to use that laptop for editing both trailers and then their own screen dances in the spring. Mm -hmm. I 